Hi folks. Welcome to this video on an intro to Riemann sums, and it really leads into the fundamental theorem of calculus, though that we'll probably deal with that in the next video. So up to here we've been finding some areas. We know that a definite integral is net signed area, and when we have a nice shape, it's easy to find area. So I've got a few to think about here, and I'm wondering what is the area underneath them from an x value of 0 to 5. And we could just sketch them. And maybe you want to pause the video and try this. All this video is going to be about just sort of understanding different ways to look at area. There's not going to be any practice, per se, that comes from it. So y equals 4 is just a horizontal line at y equals 4. Um, and if I were to figure out the area under it, here's 5, that's 4. I mean, really, it's pretty clearly just a rectangle, a 4 by 4. 4 by 5 rectangle, so area is going to be 4 by 5, or 20 units squared. If I did the same thing with y equals 3x, well, that's a diagonal line that goes through the origin. And if I'm wondering what happens with area up to 5, I mean, this point right here is the point 5, and the y value would be 15, 3 times 5, because y is 3x. So if I want this area, I'm looking at a triangle with a base of 5 and a height of 15. So half of 75, 37.5 units squared. Okay. And in this first case over here, I mean, that would be the definite integral from 0 to 5 on 4 dx. This one right here is the definite integral from 0 to 5 on 3x dx, even though we don't have any algebraic ways to find these yet. The next one. Right here, we have a y-intercept of 30, and then if I go over to 5, I'll have a y-value. Well, let's see here. We'll have an x-value of 5, so the y-value will be 10 times 5 plus 30, so 80. So in that case, I will have this slanted line. The shape that I'll get, a lot of people, I think, will see this as a triangle sitting on top of a rectangle, but you could also think of it as a trapezium or a trapezoid. It's got a height of 80 on this side and 30 on this side, and it has a width of 5. So here's a little formula for the area of a trapezium. We can go a plus b, so 30 plus 80, all over 2, times 5. Okay, so that's 110 divided by 2 is 55, times 5 gives us 275 units squared. Okay, and if we forget the unit squared part, that is the integral from 0 to 5 on 10x plus 30. These are all shapes that we can work with. And so far, they're not really giving us a lot of insight in how we deal with weirder shapes. One thing that I want to think about, though, is what if instead of going to 5, we went to just some x value that's unknown? So an x value of, let's just call it x. So this will be all the way to x. Okay, so that means that this will be the coordinate. x is just x. And the y value will be 10x plus 30. Or on this first one, we're going instead of to 5, we're going to just some x value. And on the other one, same thing. We're going to some unknown x value. What would be a formula? for each of these areas, whatever x happens to be. So that means over here, that I'd have some x value that's unknown, and the y value would be 3x. And it might be interesting at this point to just pause the video and see if you can come up with a formula. And we're back. This first one, hopefully it's clear here that you'd have a rectangle that is 4 tall and x wide, so it would be 4x. The area. That worked with the 5. It gave us 4 times 5 is 20. This one over here is going to have a width of x and a height of 3x. So the area is going to be 1 half base times height. Or you could call that 3 over 2x squared if you want. You could write it a bunch of ways. And then the last one's even weirder. It would have this width here is x. This height here is 10x plus 30. So if we use that trapezium formula, maybe I'll need a little more room here. 
area is going to be, one of these is 30 tall. The other one is 10x plus 30 tall, all over 2, times that width. It's called h over here. But for us, that's going to be x. And I can work this through. That'll give me 60 plus 10x over 2. And this seems, this seems weird. doesn't seem like we're doing anything useful here. Hopefully, it'll seem a little better in a second. That's 30 plus 5x times x. Or, I'm going to put the x squared first. 5x squared plus 30x. That's a formula for the area, no matter how wide x is. Now, let's take a look at the original functions and their area functions. What do you notice between them? 4 and 4x. 3x and 3 over 2x squared. 10x plus 30 and 5x squared plus 30x. I'm not going to deprive you of the joy of discovery, but hopefully something is, is seeming a little fishy here in calculus terms. So as long as we have sort of normal looking stuff that we know how to deal with with basic geometric formulas, finding area is no big deal, and definite integrals therefore don't seem that difficult. Unfortunately, it's not always easy to find the area under the curve, since we only know area formulas for certain specific shapes. So let's go back to our favorite nonlinear, f of x equals x squared. And if we wanted to know the area that lies between the curve and the x-axis, just until x is 1 over here. That's a lot tougher question. Now one way that you could do it is just count the number of blocks. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We could keep going. When I do this, I count 24 complete blocks. But clearly, there are some partial blocks as well. So maybe I'll start making some estimates. Maybe this will be one more here. And then this is basically one, so I'm up to two more. And these two together, three more. And this bit together, maybe four more. Five more, that's pretty full. Six more. Maybe 7, maybe 8, maybe 9. All told, maybe 33-ish blocks. And each of those blocks is 0 0.01 units squared, because we're going on a scale of 1 to 1 here. So I think that the area under this curve is about 0.33 units squared, maybe. And that means that the integral from 0 to 1 on x squared, for whatever reason, is roughly 0.33-ish. The problem with this approach is that it requires us to do a bunch of estimation. And everybody might do it slightly differently, though I think we'd probably all have something in the sort of 30 to 34, uh, 35 range, because something's sort of reasonable. But we might disagree on some specifics. It's a good approach, though, just counting the blocks. And if I had it partitioned smaller, it would be easier to do a really good job. What if we had it partitioned 100 uh, partitions between 0 and 1? This is going to get a lot better, but also a lot more tedious. So we have no formula for this shape. A common approach that we can do is we can split the area up into some rectangles. So if we just made two rectangles underneath this curve, I'm going to make one that hits right here, and goes across, and one rec... I mean, it's sort of a rectangle, but really, it, it has a height of 0. It goes like that. If you looked at that area, okay, that looks like an underestimate of the total area. In fact, it looks kind of terrible. It would be a height that comes from f at 0 times a width, because area of a rectangle is always just height times width, or length times width. And then, we'd have another height from f of 0.5, and again, a width. Okay, so f at 0, we're talking about this function here, f of x is x squared, would be 0 times 0.5, plus f at 0.5 would be uh, a half squared, or 0.25. And if I work all that out, I'll get an estimate of 0.125. Now, you might look at that and say, that is way worse than the estimate that we just had. What if instead we had rectangles that 
the edge, the right-hand edge of the rectangle is what touched the curve. Okay, so in this case, they're going to be sort of overestimates. What if I found that as an approximation for the true area under the curve? Clearly, that's going to be an overestimate. So maybe I'll do this one. I'll do this one in green. And if we did it this way, area is going to be that first height will be f at 0.5. And the width of each of these rectangles is 0.5. And then the height of the second rectangle is f at 1. That's how high this is, f at 1, which is just 1, times 0.5. So what will I get? f at 0.5, or 0.5 squared is 0.25, times width. That would be the area of this rectangle right here, plus f at 1, which is 1, times 0.5. That would be the area of this rectangle right here. And if I add those two things up, it's going to be 0.125 plus 0.5, or 0.625. That, in this case, is an overestimate of the area. And I think it would be safe to say that true area is somewhere in between these. Okay. Now, if you take those and you take the average, you get 0.375, which is pretty close to what we had before. This is not a great plan here, though, by just using two rectangles. What would make this technique better? Well, I mean, I guess, most simply, just using more rectangles. And these are called Riemann sums, where you take a shape, typically a rectangle, but it doesn't have to be, and you just divide them up thinner and thinner and have more of them and just add up their area as an approximation for the true area under the function. So if we did it with left rectangles on this one here, it would look something like this. And if we do it with right-hand rectangles on the other one, that just means the rectangle touches the curve in its right-hand corner rather than its left-hand corner, we get this. And you can see that the green one's going to be an overestimate, and the red one's, or the blue one, rather, is going to be an underestimate. But it's probably going to be better now than it was before. So I can set up all this uh, stuff here, and I'm going to find the area of each of them. This time, the width of each rectangle is going to be 0.2. So I'll have f of 0 times 0.2. Then my next rectangle would start at 0.2. If I work all of these out, and you can in gory detail, you'll get 0.24. Let's do the same for the green. My first rectangle is going to have its height governed by the y value at 0.2. But every one of these rectangles is going to have a width of 0.2. And if we work it out with these in gory detail, we'll get 0.44. So the true area is somewhere between them. If you took the average of 0.24 and 0.44, you'd get 0.34, which is very close to our initial estimate. Our initial estimate, though, by just counting blocks, we probably can't make it a whole lot better. This, we can make it better. So I'm just going to look at left-hand rectangles, but using Desmos. Using those left-hand rectangles with 10, at the top you can say it says, see it says n equals 10. It tells me that there's an area of 0.285. That's where it says i in a little gray box. What happens if we have more rectangles? Well, you can see that i number changing. Well, you can also see graphically that it's getting to be a better and better approximation of true area. So we're getting around 0.32 here, and I'm going to work my way up. I'm at n equals 70 rectangles. I can make my way up to 100 rectangles. You can see it's still not a perfect representation of the true area, because there are still those little jagged edges there. But it's much better than it was if we had, say, n equals 3 or 2, like we started with. Okay? It's a very, very good approximation. And the more rectangles that we have, 
the less it matters whether they're right-hand or left-hand rectangles. So you might ask yourself, well, what's the best number of rectangles to have? Infinity rectangles, really. And this starts to get at some of our notation issues that we've noticed so far. So for each one of these rectangles, when I had five of them, there's a width. Let's call it delta x. Okay. And if I want the area, it had been sort of f at some x value, let's call it xi, times the width, the height times the width. And we were summing these all up. And that looks like, that really looks like our integral notation. Instead of the sum, we have this special one, but it really is f of x dx. And that's sort of what those terms represent in an integral. We're talking about a height times a width, and an infinitely small width if we have infinitely many rectangles. We're going from a to b here. So these things have something to do with each other in terms of notation. Um, remember when we looked at dy by dx, you know, that really made us think of delta y over delta x. Well, here this dx really represents that infinitely small width. Now, how far you go down that rabbit hole for right now is entirely up to you. I'll set up a video for uh, some more rigorous Riemann sum stuff. But for now, let's just say, if you have more rectangles, you'll get a better idea of true area. This table gives us an idea of what happens if you have more rectangles. So at 10 rectangles, you've got a pretty good approximation. This is what it looks like with left rectangles. This is what it looks like with right rectangles. And here's the average. With 20, with 100. And you can see at a million, there's not much difference between the left and right value that we get. And it really does appear that we're zeroing in on 0.3333333 or one third. Okay. So infinitely many rectangles can really help us find that area, even in a weird shape. Now here is a offshoot question. What is the antiderivative of x squared? Well, you know it. It's one third x cubed. And you know that the antiderivative at one would also be one third. There's something fishy here. Now it is not enough to just say, oh, it's the antiderivative and you plug in the number. That's not going to work every time. Um, but that is where we're heading to with the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is coming up in the next video. So at this point, there's no practice to do. Just the idea that if you want to find area, there are some techniques you can use. You can count blocks. You can make infinitely many rectangles or there seems to be something fishy going on with the antiderivative.